Let's take our hymnals, please, and turn to 354. 354, let's stand for this first song, if you would. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. 354. We do want to come before you and uh, bring our petitions before you this evening. Father, thank you for the opportunity to do that, and thank you, Lord, for each one that is here. Please bless the message. Pray that you would bless the young people that are here tonight. Help them to understand it, Father. Pray that uh, they would go from here having learned more of your word, Father. Pray your blessing on the prayer time afterwards as we bring our petitions before you. May you uh, bless that time as well. Thank you, Father, and bless those who are listening online. Help us all to be able to uh, get something new and fresh from your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is Young People's Night, so let's turn to 479 and sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus Loves Me, 479. Sing out, young people. We want to hear your young voices. <clears throat> Jesus loves me. Close beside me, oh. 
from the back tonight. And if somebody if somebody is watching online and it doesn't work, please call uh, my cell phone and we'll get it fixed right away. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay, well, last, last uh, Young People's Night, we did a study on uh, the religions of Babel, and we got halfway through that. Um, and that's for the older young folks. This evening, we're going to have something for the younger kids, the younger kids, uh, geared for the 10 and under young folks. So I hope you enjoy this, young people. We're going to talk about life in Bible times, life in Bible times. What was life like? And we're going to start with how you got buried, life in Bible times, funerals and tombs. Let's see if this thing will turn the page. There we go. Jewish people in Bible times buried their dead as soon as possible. It was a hot climate. In the hot climate, pretty soon people's uh, dead body would start to smell bad, and people didn't enjoy smelling their loved one, and so they would bury them right away. They saw no need to embalm, or embalm means to cause the body to be mummified. Jewish laws about not touching a dead body may have discouraged this practice of embalming or mummifying a, a dead body, because in the scripture, God limited how much people were to touch a dead body. Funeral processions were very common. The body was carried on a wooden beard, a wooden beard. Um, and here you see a, a person carried on the shoulders. They're going to go to bury him. Uh, by the way, before we get going, I apologize if some of these men in these pictures have long hair. Again, people are doing a pretty good job illustrating what it looked like back in Bible times, but... Uh, it's not, not quite right sometimes. So Jewish, Jewish men did not have long hair. We, we saw pictures of them going into captivity, the, the ungodly Jewish leaders going into captivity when Brother Cloud was here. And the, the drawings of them, they had short hair. Even the ungodly ones had short hair. But the procession, the funeral procession, moved out of the town or city to a burial place. It was on such a bier as this that the son of the widow of Nain, the, the, the dead son, was being carried when Jesus intervened. Remember that story? And Jesus stopped the bier, and he uh, raised the dead boy back to life for that, for that widow woman. A funeral procession was a noisy affair, as the Jews believed in venting their grief with loud wailing, beating on the chest, and even tearing their clothes. Friends, relatives, and even professional mourners joined in expressing their grief. It was these professional mourners that Jesus dismissed when he raised the daughter of Jairus to life. Psalms and other songs were sung, and sometimes musical instruments, such as the flute, were played. According to Roman tradition, the bodies of the criminals that Rome executed were either thrown into an unmarked grave or placed in a mass tomb, or they were burned and cremated with the garbage of the city. Joseph of Arimathea intervened about the body of Jesus, and he went to Pilate and begged, begged permission to take the body of Jesus 
so that none of those terrible things would happen to, to his body. And he took the body of Jesus, as we know, and placed it in his new unused tomb that was his family tomb. But Jews did not normally practice cremation. That, that would have been very, very rare, if not unheard of. The first tombs in the Bible were caves. Over time, caves were, were refined into burial places carved out of rock, carved out of rock. A large stone like this one was uh, placed or rolled across the entrance of the tomb to protect it from scavenging animals so the body would be left alone. It was such a stone like this that was covering the entrance to Lazarus' tomb that Jesus asked to be removed. And then he called Lazarus forth out of the tomb and Lazarus was resurrected by the Lord. In, in uh, this picture, here is a tomb with a stone rolled back. The women visiting Jesus' tomb wondered how they were going to roll such a big stone like that one back to get into the tomb. These stones could weigh as much as 10 tons for a rich man's tomb. The, the, bigger, the, the richer the person, the bigger the tomb, the bigger the stone was. And I need to show the credits on these things. So we'll go to, go to the next one. That's funerals and tombs. Uh, in Bible times. Now we're going to look at some, some weaving, we weavers and looms. Weaving was practiced from early Bible times. Let's have a, a, a sword drill, young people. Hold your Bibles over your heads. Fingers out of the pages. Exodus 35, 35. Exodus 35, 35. Go. Whoever gets it first, first person to stand on their feet gets to read it. But you have to have found it before you stand. Exodus 35, verse 35. Who's got it? Some of you are too, too shy to read it. I can tell. Some hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen of, of the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. Okay, so fine linen of the weaver. And this is talking about uh, the Lord is telling Moses to call Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, to build the tabernacle and all the wise-hearted men and the wise-hearted women to start weaving fine linen for the, the, uh, the linen coats of the priests and the Levites. The Egyptians were especially skilled in, in weaving. Ezekiel 27, verse 7 says, Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt. Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt. <clears throat> The Israelites most likely learned weaving from the Egyptians. Joseph, we are told, wore fine linen when he became the governor of Egypt. The Bible says that Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about, about his neck. So the Egyptians were fine weavers and the, the, the Israelites most likely learned it from, from them and from their grandparents. Men, men wove in ancient times. Men were weavers. We just talked about Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur. He was skilled in the art of weaving, as we read in Exodus 35. God called him out to, to weave for the tabernacle. Also, 1 Chronicles 4 tells us of some men that were weavers. The sons of Shelah, the son of Judah, were Ur, the father of Lakah, and Laeda, the father of Marisha, and the families of the house of them that wrought fine linen of the house of Ashbia. So e even men in Bible times were weavers, especially the commercial weavers. If you were of a family that um, made and sold linen, then your daddy, if you were a boy, your daddy would teach you how to weave, and that would be your occupation for the rest of your life, most likely. But usually, unless you were a commercial weaver, it was generally just a task done by the, the ladies, the mothers of the household. The book of Proverbs <coughs> talks about a woman who layeth her hands to the spindle 
and her hands hold the distaff. There's a lady holding a distaff. That's in Proverbs 31, verse 19. The, the Bible talks about that. Wool was extensively used for clothing, while for finer work, flax was used. Sometimes flax and wool were woven together, but the, I believe the Jews were forbidden to, to uh, weave a material, one, one piece of material of two different types of, of cloth. Coarser kinds of garments, such as tent cloth, sackcloth, and hairy garments of the poor, were made of coats of, were made of goats or camel hair. Elijah and John the Baptist wore such clothes. They wore camel's hair. Fleeces were gathered from sheep to make wool. A spindle was used to twist the fibers into a length of yarn. And then strands of the fiber were fed onto the wooden spindle. The spindle was then spun to twist the fiber into balls of yarn. Looms were generally upright frames made of wood, like this one here. Delilah used such a loom to weave Samson's long hair when he was lying to her and said, I will become weak as any other man if you weave the locks of my head into a, into a loom. <clears throat> Lengths of yarn were hung from a top frame to fall vertically to the ground. Small weights were tied to the base of these to keep them taut or tight. The weaver would then use a wooden shuttle to thread the horizontal threads of wool back and forth through the vertical threads. We read of a shuttle in Job 7, 6. Let's have another sword drill. Bible's up. Job 7, 6. Go. Job 7, 6. who has Job 7, 6. All right. That's a good verse, but it's not Job 7, 6. <laughs> Who's got Job 7, 6? Somebody read it quick. Somebody new, read it quick. Be brave. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Thank you, very good. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope, <laughs> excuse me, without hope, Job 7, 6. So using this method, elaborate patterns could be woven using dyed wool. The Babylonians wove pictures of men and animals on their clothes. Textures with golden thread were considered the most valuable. Some garments were woven without a seam. Priestly garments were woven in this way, and Jesus wore a seamless coat like that. It was a valuable item that Jesus had. Hence, the soldiers who crucified Jesus cast lots to see who would have it in John 19, 23. And then again, I need to show the credits. And then we're going to go on to carpenters and carpentry in Bible times. Carpenters and carpentry in Bible times. Again, some of these men may have long hair. That would be incorrect for Jewish men to have long hair. Carpenters in the Bible have significance, as Joseph was a carpenter and trained Jesus up in this trade. People said of Jesus, is not, is not this the carpenter's son? Mark, Mark 6 tells us. <clears throat> Whoops, wrong one. Carpenters often had a workshop, and some could work with stone. The really good carpenters could work with stone, iron, and copper, as well as with wood, because oftentimes the rich people would want a mixture of stuff in their building. They worked at a coarse wooden carpenter's table. Practically every carpenter would have a carpenter's table. Isaiah mentions four of the tools of a carpenter. A measuring line, a marking tool, a plane, and an axe. 
Let's read that. Somebody find for me Isaiah 44, 14. Isaiah 44, 14. Go ahead. And by the way, again, we're going to have a quiz about this after we're done. So this sounds like a pretty good quiz question. Isaiah 44, 14. Who's got it? Hmm, I'm sorry. That's not talking about a marking tool, a measuring line, a plane, and an axe. That's verse 13, the worst report. Okay. The carpenter stretches out his rule, he marketh it out with the line, he fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of the man, that it may remain in the house. Thank you. The carpenter stretches out his rule. He marketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man. So the, there we have uh, a rule, which is a measuring line, and we have planes, we have a compass, and what's, what else is there? And we, the, not in this verse, but in, in other verses of Scripture, the Bible talks about axes. So I'm sorry I didn't get this uh, verse correct with my information here. But a measuring line, a marking tool, and a plane are mentioned in this verse. And an axe is mentioned in other, other verses of Scripture. The axe was used to shape timber of all sorts as well as to fell trees. So an axe was one of the main tools of a carpenter. It had an iron head fastened to a wooden handle with a thong, a leather thong. In early times, people used ribbon flint tools as saws, ribbon flint tools. Later, these were made from strips of metal that had been set in frames of wood, like this saw here. The carpenter's saw is mentioned in the Bible in 1 Kings 7. Carpenter's saw, we won't go there, but the Bible mentions the carpenter's saw. Hammers were made of stone or metal. And mallets, like this one that he's holding, is made of wood. Jeremiah refers to the use of to the use of, of a hammer and nails, a hammer and nails in Jeremiah ten four. The use of an awl, A W L, awl, is mentioned in Exodus twenty one six and Deuteronomy fifteen seventeen. These instruments for bo <coughs> for boring were often set in bone handles. Then we have chisels. Chisels are made of bronze or iron. And some carpenters worked with a bow drill, a very early type of drill. A bow drill would be twisted so it could turn the drill in his left hand there. The, the bow drill could also be used to turn wood, allowing the carpenter to shape the wood with chisels, a form of early lathe. Carpenters made wooden plows, wooden yokes, which were vital for farming. But they also made furniture for homes such as doors, roofs, tables, stools, and storage chests. The word carpenter can also mean builder in the Bible. The word carpenter can also mean builder in the Bible. And builder can mean a carpenter, somebody who works with all sorts of things, not just wood, but they, they can fit wood to stone and stone to wood, that type of thing. The most ornamental work would be paneling for roofs, lattice work for windows, and decorative art on house doors, that type of thing. A carpenter took great pride in his work and displayed a high level of craftsmanship. And again, I need to show the credits. And then we're going to move on to fishing boats and ports, <coughs> ports on the Sea of Galilee. And this one I'm pretty sure has long hair on some of the men, so again... That's, that's incorrect pictures. The Sea of Galilee, or Kinneret, as it is called in Hebrew, is not a sea, <clears throat> as the name implies, Sea of Galilee, but a large freshwater lake shaped like a harp. Its main source of fresh water is the River Jordan, which flows through it from north to south. And we've seen this on Brother Cloud's uh, pictures, but it's good to go over it again, especially for the young people. Lake Galilee is about 13 miles long 
and 8.1 miles wide. The lake has a total area of 64.4 square miles and a maximum depth of 141 feet. Its circumference is approximately 33 miles. It is the lowest freshwater lake on Earth at 686 feet below sea level. Josephus was able to gather 230 boats on Galilee in the first century when he opposed the Romans. <coughs> so there must have been more than 230 boats on this lake in operation <coughs> during that time. Many conclude that seven Seven of Jesus' disciples were fishermen, Andrew, Simon Peter, James, John, Thomas, Philip, and Nathaniel. <clears throat> we're not completely sure about that, about a couple of those, but that's a guess. The hills around Galilee, especially on the east side, where they reach 2,000 feet high, are a source of cool, dry, descending air. <clears throat> and that's, that's how that... Uh, bad storms can arise quickly on Galilee because Galilee can be hot and then cool air comes, comes blowing down from those hillsides. Over the sea there is warm, moist, ascending air. <coughs> this large difference in height between surrounding land and the sea can cause large temperature and pressure changes. Strong winds can funnel through the hills to descend on the Sea of Galilee causing sudden storms. Very quick storms can arise. Jesus and his disciples were caught at least once in such an unexpected, to the disciples, unexpected, but not to Jesus, unexpected violent storm when crossing to the other side of, of Galilee. The experienced fishermen on board were afraid for their lives. Jesus commanded the storm to stop, and it did, showing his power over the wind and waves. This map shows the harbors around Galilee in the time of Jesus. They were plotted by a fisherman, Mindel Nunn, between 1989 and 1991, <coughs> when there was a severe drought, drought and the water levels fell. One of the most important locations for fishermen was the town known as Magdala in Aramaic, or Terakea in Greek. The name Terakea comes from the Greek verb to preserve by artificial means. And there in, Mag in Magdala, or Terakea, fish were processed for selling and preserved using salt brought from the Dead Sea region. Magdala was also where Mary Magdalene was from. In 1978, when the waters receded in a drought, an ancient fishing boat dated from the time of Jesus was found on the northwest shore by two local fishermen, Moshi and Yuval Lufan. The boat... <coughs> excuse me must be catching that cold. <clears throat> the boat has been dated to 40 BC, plus or minus 80 years. Based on, on radiocarbon dating and, and 50 BC to AD 50, uh, based on finds of pottery and nails in the boat. So there's two different dating methods, car carbon dating and then the pottery that was found in it. <coughs> the remains of this boat are exhibited in the Yigal Allen Museum in Kibbutz, Guinnessar. The boat was 27 feet long, 7.5 feet wide, and with a maximum height of about 4.3 feet. This model of the boat shows you what it would have looked like. The boat was constructed primarily of cedar planks joined together by pegged mortise and tenon joints. It has a shallow draft with a flat bottom, allowing it to get very close to the shore. The boat could have been sailed or rowed. It would have used a single square sail affixed amidships. Based on the vessel's size, it probably would have had a basic crew of four to five rowers and a helmsman. The boat would have been steered by means of two steering oars. A life-size reconstruction of the boat can be found at Kibbutz Ginosar, Ginosar. The Galilean boat had a stern deck for the storage of large fishing nets and beneath its planks, such a deck provided a somewhat secluded area where tired fishermen could rest. Jesus may have taken advantage of such a feature when, during a storm, he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow, the Bible says. 
It has been suggested that the pillow could have been a sandbag kept on board as, a, as ballast, but we don't know that for sure. Boats such as this played a large role in Jesus' life and ministry and are mentioned 50 times in the Gospels. Boats were anchored with large stones, not metal, but stones. Here are some ancient anchors found in Caesarea Maritime in Israel. Anchors in Galilee were made from the local black basalt rock. Here are two such anchors in a museum garden in Galilee. Fishing often took place at night, and the Bible records that some of the disciples had fished all night without catching anything. And again, I need to show the credits, and we're going to move to one last section tonight, Galilee's fish and the fishing nets that they used. There are believed to be between 18 and 24 different species of, indig of indigenous fish in the Lake Galilee. <clears throat> mushed fish, M-U-S-H-T, however you say that, mushed fish, was one of the most popular fish to be eaten. Mushed means comb in Arabic, which describes the spiny dorsal fin. Its flat shape makes them ideal for the frying pan. They also have, a, have few small bones and an easily removable spine. Roasting fish by an open fire was a common way to cook fish, and Jesus roasted some fish after his resurrection to feed his, his disciples breakfast one morning, if you remember. The most famous of this group of fish is the tilapia Galilea, Galilea also known as the St. Peter's fish. As the water cools for the winter, the mushed are the only large fish that move in shoals in the shallow water. It may have been such fish that were caught when the disciples were told by Jesus to throw their nets on the other side of the boat. Another important type of fish are known as biny fish. These fish are easily identified by the barbells or whisker type flesh that hangs from around the mouth. These fish were popular for the Sabbath feasts. The third type of important fish is the sardine or small fish that tends to group together in large shoals. It is likely that it was sardines that Jesus used in the feeding of the 5,000 and possibly the 4,000 as well. Jewish law prohibited them eating any fish without scales. We're told that in Leviticus 11 verses 9 through 12. This included shellfish, catfish, eels, rays, and lampreys. Some fishing was done with hooks and lines, either on poles when fishing from shore or on trawls in deep sea fishing. This picture shows two bronze fish hooks from the first century AD found in Galilee. Jesus once told Peter to cast a fish hook into the Sea of Galilee and to look into its mouth for a coin, then pay his and Peter's temple tax with it. And that is exactly what happened. Peter must be about the only person in the world to ever catch a fish with a coin in its mouth. And not just any coin, it was a coin worth exactly what was needed to pay the temple tax for two people. We're told that story in Matthew 17. There were two main methods of fishing using nets, cast nets and drag nets. There were two types of cast nets, one of a smaller mesh for sardines and one of a larger mesh for larger fish. The cast net is a, is a circular net about 15 feet in diameter with weights around the edge and a long line attached to the center of the net. The net is released with a broad sweep of the arm over shallow water near the shore where the shoals of fish can be seen. A, net, a cast net or hand net was probably used by the disciples when asked by Jesus to cast their net over on the other side of the boat. It is thrown in such a manner that the leaded edge forms the base of a cone, the apex being formed by the fisherman holding the center of the net in his hand. The cone thus formed encloses the fish. As the center cord is pulled up, the weights come together, trapping the fish. Sometimes fishermen jump into the sea to adjust the net before drawing, drawing it in. Peter could have been the one whose turn it was to jump out of the boat and adjust the net for drawing. When he learned that it was Jesus who stood on the shore, he put on his tunic and swam ashore. The second method of using a net to catch fish was to use a drag net or sign. Sign? Sign? S-E-I-N-E. I didn't look up how you're supposed to say that word. Sorry. 
The long net could be drawn out between the shore and a boat or in deeper water between two boats. Don't look at the note. That the answer's over here. I'm sitting between two young men. They can see my answers, my questions and answers now. <clears throat> the dragnet could be 1,000 feet long, hanging vertically up to 25 feet deep, with towing lines attached to each end. This is a modern dragnet being used on Lake Galilee today. Corks were attached to the top of the net to make it float, while weights were attached to the base of the net to make it sink. The net can be three nets in one. There are two outside nets which have a larger opening that fish can freely swim through. But in between the two, there's a finer mesh net to snare them. Are we having issues, Nathan? Okay. Most likely, Simon Peter and Andrew in one boat worked with James and John in another to suspend a long drag net between the boats. The boats would then be rowed to enclose a circular space, and when the boats met, the nets were hauled in. Sometimes the net with the fish enclosed is towed into shallow water before drawing. This method may have been used by the disciples in several Bible narratives, Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 5, and John 21. Drag nets could also be used by a team on shore while others used a boat to row the net out to sea. The boat was then hauled in a circular direction back to shore, rowed, excuse me, not hauled. The boat was then rowed in a circular direction back to shore, trapping any fish caught in the loop. The nets were then hauled in from the shore. Fishermen constantly had to spend time mending their nets. It was while Simon Peter... Andrew, James, and John were mending their nets on the shore that Jesus found them and called them to be his disciples. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishing was, was often done at night where a blazing torch was sometimes used to attract fish towards the boats. Fishermen also pounded their feet and splashed their oars to make as much noise as possible. Why would they do that? They arranged their nets in the water in such a way that the fish, frightened by the noise they made, headed straight into the trap. And that's boats and ports and fish and fishing nets on the Sea of Galilee. That's, you can, you can turn off. That's what, a little bit of what, like, of what life was like during Bible times. All right. Now we're going to have some questions. I'm going to go back to the pulpit now. Okay, how many 11-year-olds and under do we have here tonight? Quite a few. Raise your hand if you're 12 years or older. 12 years to, to 20. We'll say to 20. I got two troublemakers. Okay, that's pretty even. That's pretty even. So we'll just stick with 11 and under and 12 and over. 12 to 20. Younger kids, how would a Jewish funeral procession be described? A Jewish funeral procession. Would it be des described as very solemn, somber, quiet, and reverent? Or would it be described as loud and noisy with professional wailers? Sharon. Loud and noisy. Loud and noisy. Good job. That's right. Older kids, <clears throat> Jews did not embalm or mummify their dead. Give one good scriptural reason why this probably was the custom. Well, 
Very good. Scripture limited the touching of dead bodies, or God limited the touching of dead bodies. <clears throat> Younger kids, was weaving only done by women? Would it be very strange to have seen a man weaving? Chloe. Very good. Men and women weave. No, it would not have been strange to see a man weaving. Both men and women were weavers, although it does appear that more women did learn that art than men. Older kids, what book and chapter of the Bible talk, talks about a virtuous woman spinning yarn with a spindle and distaff? What? Very good. Proverbs 31. Do you know the verse? Anybody know the verse? Verse 19, verse 19. I think maybe there's also another verse, verse 13, might talk about uh, weaving as well. Younger kids, did carpenters only work with wood? No. no, that is correct. Many good carpenters would also work with stone, iron, copper, and wood. Older kids, Name two of the carpenter's tools that Isaiah mentions in Isaiah 44, verse 13. Two of the tools that Isaiah mentioned, carpenter's tools. There were three of them in that verse. But I'll let you have it if you remember the fourth one that, was, that we were told was in that verse, but it wasn't, but it's talked about elsewhere. Plain and an axe. Very good. The axe wasn't actually in that verse, but a plane was. There was also a measuring line and marking tools. And a compass. The compass is what the Bible talks about. Name three other tools, younger kids. Name three other tools that a Bible carpenter would have in his shop. What can you remember of all those pictures? Chloe, what do you remember? No, you can't name the ones I just named. Three other ones. What's a rate? What's the tool that everybody uses, guys? Matthew, Isaiah. Your daddy that has a tool. If he goes to work with carpentry tools, he always has this tool in his toolbox. Come now. What's your favorite tool? Yes. A hammer. A hammer, yes. What might a carpenter need to cut his wood with? A saw. Very good. What else might a carpenter need? Well, he would make a wooden plow. Can you think of something else that he would that he would uh, be using to make his wooden plow with? Yes. Well, I, we already talked about the measuring line. What would he put his work on to work on? Every carpenter would have this sitting in his shop. A work table. Even though it's just a table, it is a tool. A saw, a work table, and a hammer. Okay, we'll give it to you. You got it. <laughs> might, might need a little help, a little push, but you guys got it. Didn't they? Or am I, am I, giving, am I being too soft, adults? All right, good. Older kids, if you miss one, one word of this, you, you lost. What other word can carpenter mean in the Bible? Very good, a builder. And a builder can also mean a carpenter. 
Younger kids, is the Sea of Galilee a body of salt water or fresh water? Who's going to do it? Who's going to talk? Who do you vote should talk for you? Who do you kids want, want to guess for you? Her, her, her. <laughs> Who do you trust the most? Sharon, you had your hand up first. Oh, my goodness. No. They missed that one. The Sea of Galilee is a body of fresh water. Fresh water. It's not really a sea, even though it's called a sea. Older kids, what town on the shore of the Sea of Galilee was known for preserving and exporting fish? Its name in Greek comes from the word meaning to preserve by artificial means. Magdala, very good. All right, young, younger kids, the older kids are ahead of you. You've got three chances left to catch up. In 1978, younger kids, 1978, when the lake water receded in a drought, got lower, what did two local fishermen find on the bottom of the lake that dated to the time of Christ? Somebody else. Any of you other kids listening? These kids are my kids, so they're brave enough to talk to me, I guess. Do you remember what was found on the bottom of the lake, Louisa? No? You kids know what was there. What was it? A boat. A boat. Very, very good. It's the remains of a fishing boat. Older kids, what were the anchors made of? Who? Are you 12? Oh, okay. <laughs> Can't keep you straight. Rocks or large stones. You're sitting right there. You're one of the younger kids. <clears throat> okay, younger kids. The fishermen of Galilee never went out fishing at night because it was too dangerous. True or false? The fishermen of Galilee never went out fishing at night because it was too dangerous. Is that true or is that false? False. You are correct. Older kids. The Jewish fishermen often sold clams and oysters at the fish market. True or false and why? Okay, but why? what's the big deal about scales? You're right, but what's the big deal about scales? Yes, that's the, the scripture for, forbids Jews from eating shellfish or anything without scales. Good job. All right, younger kids, two left <clears throat> to catch up. You're going to have to have them miss one too. Who was it that caught a fish with a coin in his mouth? <clears throat> Somebody else. Who was it that caught a fish with a coin in its mouth? Matthew? Do you know? Louisa? Who caught the fish with the coin in its mouth? Who, what, what was his name? Sophia? Do you know? Oh, she knows. What was his name, Sophia? You, you can get a point for your team. Did she say it? Oh. Can you say it to me? What was his name? Isaiah, can you help her out? No? <laughs> Bethany? Okay, Susie. Peter. Peter. Very good. You're, you're paying attention. <clears throat> Older kids, what were Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John doing when Jesus found them and called them to be his disciples? Very good. Mending their nets. Younger, younger kids, this is your last one. What extra item did the fishermen take with them at night 
What extra item did the fishermen take with them at night to attract the fish to their boats and nets? Chloe. A torch to light. Or they probably they probably did light it before they left because they didn't have matches. All right, we're caught up. This is the tiebreaker. Older kids, how many of Jesus' disciples were probably fishermen? Seven, very good. The older kids won the day. But that was a close race. Good job. All right. Do we have some prayer requests? Prayer lists tonight. Thank you, sir. We need to be praying for our missionaries. I have some some uh, letters to read in just a second after we get offline. Can't I'm not going to read them online. <clears throat> but pray for our missionaries. Pray for the Burma Church. It's going through a little bit of a hard time right now. We'll find out more about that in just a second. Pray also for uh, uh, buyers and the church in Astoria as they, they're getting ready to um, have their gospel tent meeting beginning July 10th, July 10th. So just some announcements real quick before we get offline. Uh, this coming Saturday, gentlemen, we're having the, the prayer breakfast at my house. Um, uh, Brother Nathaniel is allowed to travel to my house to do work that day. And he hasn't been able to be with us, so I thought it would be a, a good opportunity to, to fellowship with him and get him involved in the church again uh, for one, one meeting at least. So we will be having prayer breakfast at my house at 8 o'clock in the morning in Kathlamet. If you want to carpool across the ferry, uh, Brother Nathan might be taking his van, so you might all be able to fit in his van. So if you need a ride across the ferry, please contact Brother Nathan. Also, Brother Byers is going to be, he called me today and he wanted to share uh, some things of what we could do to help them as, a, as our church, helping their church, um, uh, get involved in the outreach during uh, their, their tent meeting. And so he asked if he could share and basically he's going to be preaching for us and, and sharing with us next Wednesday night what we can do, what our church can do to help their church out during during this this week, and of course, we need to be praying for that for that week as well, most most importantly of all. But he will be here next week. We will be taking up a love offering for him, and for the the, the tent meeting while he's here. So that's next Wednesday night. Brother Byers will be preaching for us. Uh, let's see. Monday is is the Fourth uh, of July parade. We are going to be involved in that Sunday afternoon. We're all going to be, anybody who wants to help build the parade or, Brother David, are we building a, building a float? Excuse me, that's build a float, not build the parade. We're decorating, We're decorating a pickup. So anybody that wants to be involved in helping us decorate our float, which is a pickup, needs to stay after church, after the, me after the meal Sunday. And we're going to be decorating our float right then. And we're also, if, if you are going to be involved in the parade at all, We'll be talking about uh, talking about it after church Sunday. What we need to do, where we need to meet, and that sort of thing. So please be ready to talk about the parades after church on Sunday, and then stay if you want to be a part of putting the the, the float together. All right. Um, I think that's all the announcements uh, that I need to make before Sunday. Okay. So we're going to say good night, and uh, then I'll be reading these prayer letters.